Amen. Well, let's come to the Word of God this evening. And we're in Daniel chapter 12 tonight, the book of Daniel chapter 12. Do thank George again for his very kind words of welcome. Thank you for coming out. And we do again look to the Lord to bless our coming together uh, this evening. Do remember the meeting tomorrow night. Uh, we're going to look at the days of Lot, a uh, controversial subject, uh, but we want to look at it and we want to open up the Scriptures and we just want to be faithful uh, to the Word of God. So do remember our meeting again uh, tomorrow evening. Daniel chapter 12, we're going to read from verse number 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that is found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. We'll end at verse number four, and we do trust the Lord to bless the public reading of his own precious, uh, inerrant, infallible, and inspired word to our hearts this evening. The Apostle Paul talks about three uh, great aspects of life faith, hope, and love, all of which are, are necessary for you and I to, to know that complete fulfillment in life. When you come to a prophecy, you often think of hope. And if you take away hope from people, really, what have they left? If you're someone who's not too well, I have someone at the moment on well up in Altnagelvin, and it seemed for a while they weren't going to do anything for him, and you could see him just deteriorate. And you could see him lose the will to live. And his wife said to me, he really has given up. All of a sudden, they said, we're going to have a meeting on Thursday, and we're going to decide what we're going to do, and what a difference it made. Just even the thought that they would do something lifted his spirits, and there was a change in his countenance. Take away hope, and really, what do we have? And hope is important to all of us. It's particularly important, as I said, to those who are suffering. When we come to the Word of God for the people of God, we have a future hope. We have a hope beyond all other hopes, a hope that gives us, indeed, a full and rich meaning to life. Titus 2, verse 13, Paul says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, in Colossians 1, verse 27, Paul talks about Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you have that hope tonight? It's a wonderful thing to be able to say that we have hope this evening. How sad to have no hope. The hymn writer said, Oh, to be without a Savior, with no hope, nor refuge nigh. Can it be, O oh, blessed Savior, one without thee dares to die? Imagine having no hope tonight. Thank God those of us who are saved have hope this evening. And when we come to the book of Daniel, we discover something about that hope. I read about a scientist who, who died, and they wondered what they would put on his headstone. Uh, and they put uh, three simple words on his headstone, he died learning. When it comes to prophetic scriptures, we could always say that we're always learning. There's always something new, something we can glean uh, from the Word of God, such a, a wonderful thing. And the study of prophecy is is so valuable to the child of God. It's valuable for a number of reasons. It's valuable because it's a wonderful way to authenticate the Word of God. Look at the Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled in the New Testament, and you're left with no doubt that the book we have this evening is the inspired Word of God. Not only uh, does it authenticate the Word of God, but it, uh, it reminds us of the sovereignty of God. We're reminded in all the events that are taking place in the world that God's still in the throne, and that our God rules, and our God reigns. It's a wonderful thing, the teaching of the second coming and the study of prophecy, not only to authenticate the Word of God, not only to, to remind us of the sovereignty of God, but to motivate and comfort believers. What a motivation 
What a motivation to holy living to know that Jesus is coming again. What a comfort, as we've already said, to have that blessed hope in your heart tonight. It motivates and comforts the believers. Fourthly, tonight, it's the wonderful way in which we warn the lost and we tell them that Jesus is coming and is coming soon. I want to look at these first four verses, but in order to do it right, we must be able to set it in the context. I want you to go back into Daniel chapter 11 just for a few moments. Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 through to verse 35 are some of the greatest prophetic scriptures in the Word of God, and their teaching has been fulfilled. They are so accurate, so accurate, that some people cast doubt on the authenticity of the book of Daniel. Because the events from verse 1 through to verse 35 were so accurate, some say they must have been written after the events and not before the events. But when you come to verse number 35, we then jump into the future. Look at verse 35. And some of them of understanding shall fall uh, to try them and to purge them and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. And we jump towards the end times. If you like, the prophecies in the first 35 verses are all historical. They've all been fulfilled. And then we jump right to the time of the end. And we discover some wonderful things that are going to uh, take place. Notice verse number 36. I'm not spend much time in this this evening. It says, The king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that is determined shall be done. This is Antichrist. You see, he's a dictator. The king shall do according to his will. Notice he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. He'll, he'll claim deity. He'll be a dictator. That's the ruler that is yet to come to this planet. And so you can see the future aspect here. You can see the rule of Antichrist in verse number 36. You can see his religion in verse number 37. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers nor the desire of woman, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. He wants to be worshipped. Remember what Satan said? I will be like the Most High. This is the closest he's going to come to. When Antichrist will indeed claim to be God. There's a, there's a little line in that verse that's very interesting, verse 37. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers, nor the desire of woman. If you go back into the old commentaries that looked at uh, Daniel chapter 11, most of them said the desire of woman was, was the Messiah. For a Jewish woman, her desire was to give birth to the Messiah. They knew the seed of the woman would come, and so he will have no time for Christ, and that's true. But you know, as time has progressed, many people believe now the fact that he will not have the desire of woman could mean that Antichrist will be a homosexual. Now, that didn't seem possible a few years ago didn't seem that someone who was from a homosexual background could ever be a world leader, but how he would be welcomed tonight. Indeed, how he would be embraced so warmly tonight. And there is a possibility that that just means exactly what it says there. Antichrist could be a homosexual. I don't want to spend much time at this. I want to just to see uh, the scene here. Look at verse 38. In his estate shall he honor the God of forces. This is what he's going to rely on. He's going to rely on military power. If you look at verse number 40, he will not have it all his own way. There will be some rebellion. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Verse 41, he shall enter into the glorious land. Antichrist eventually will come to Israel, and much will be fulfilled when he enters into to the Holy Land. But then when you come to the last verse, verse number 45, you read about the ruination. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. God's going to deal with him. Indeed, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, and he's going to deal with Antichrist. But I want you to see, when we come into Daniel chapter 11, and move into Daniel chapter 12. Remember, chapter divisions are not inspired. 
They're useful, they're helpful. But if you were to read the book of Daniel as it was originally given, you'll read from verse number 45 in chapter 11, and you'll go right into verse 1 of chapter 12. Now, that opens up then the beginning of chapter 12, verse 1. Notice what it says, at that time. And so, during that time, it doesn't mean after Antichrist has been dealt with, but during that time when Antichrist is ruling and reigning, when we're in the last days, when we're in that tribulation period, certain things are going to happen. And that's what we find in these opening verses of Daniel chapter 12. Notice the intervention in verse number 1. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. As I said, we're in that same period. We're in the end times. And notice what it says, Michael shall stand up. Now, what do we know about Michael? Back in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, we meet Michael again. And this is what it says of him in Daniel 10, verse 13. This is a wonderful chapter. Sometime you have time, just read it. Harry Ironside said, if Daniel chapter 10 wasn't in the Bible, I wouldn't believe it. Because Daniel, an old man, gets down to pray. And Daniel's answer to his prayer is hindered because of demonic activity. And demons hinder the answer to Daniel's prayer. As I said, you wouldn't believe it, only it's in the Word of God. Then in Daniel 10, verse 13, this is what it says. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me, one and twenty days, that's the twenty-one days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the king of Persia. Michael fights Satan and his demons to make way for the answer to Daniel's prayer. And so we learn about Michael. He's constantly battling with the devil. But there's some other things we're going to learn about Michael this evening. In verse 21 in Daniel chapter 10, But I will show you that which is noted in the Scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. Not only is he one that contends with the devil, but he's called Michael, your prince. Now, who are, what does uh, Daniel mean by Michael, your prince, or what does God mean? Well, he has a special relationship to Israel. He's one that's contending with the devil. He's one who has a special relationship with Israel. When we come to Daniel 12, verse 1, we see another title given to him. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Again, you can see him standing up for Israel, and you can see the close link with Israel. You don't need Michael again until you get into the New Testament. And you meet Michael in the book of Jude, verse number 9. And Jude uh, chapter 1 and in Jude uh, verse 8, uh, it talks about those who are false teachers, those who are heretics. And it says they speak evil of dignitaries, among other things. And many people try to work out what it means to speak evil of dignitaries. It seems to mean, and I go along with John MacArthur here, they have no time for authority. It's the sort of person you would have in your church who won't respect the oversight, won't respect the elders, and if they're not happy, they'll go and form their own church because they speak evil of dignitaries and they don't respect authority. And that's what it's going to be like in the last days. These are the sort of things that are going to happening. This is what it says in verse 9 because Jude, if you like, is drawing a contrast here. He says, yet Michael the archangel, now Michael's called an archangel. Sometimes we talk about archangels. The Bible only talks about one archangel. And so it's likely there's only one archangel, and that archangel is Michael. Verse 9, yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, and here again he's battling with the devil, disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring a railing accusation against, but said the Lord rebuked them. What really the writer in Jude was saying is that uh, Michael didn't uh, use any defamatory language when it came to dealing with the devil. Rather, he left them for the Lord to sort out. And he's drawing a contrast between those who won't respect authority and how even Michael had a certain respect for the devil. Now, we don't know why he was arguing with the devil over the body of Moses. Some argue it's to do with the, what happened in the Mount of Transfiguration. I'll uh, leave you uh, to work that out yourself. But I just want you to see Michael is someone who, who stands up for Israel and someone who's battling the devil. I just want you to get that into your mind this evening. Because when we come to the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16, this is what it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. 
Now, if there's only one archangel, then that's Michael. Now, what's Michael doing there at the rapture? I believe Michael's there at the rapture for a number of reasons, but one in particular this evening. I believe when the Lord comes to the air to take the church home, then there's going to be that time of tribulation upon the world. And remember, Jesus could come tonight to take the church home. And during that time of tribulation, God again will turn his attention to the nation of Israel. I believe that's why Michael's there at the rapture, because Israel's coming into focus again. Michael, the archangel. Some of you may have noticed last night we met Michael again in Revelation 12. Do you remember he was battling with the devil, and the devil was kicked out of heaven. It says there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels. Remember how he was cast down to the earth and how he persecuted the woman? He persecuted Israel. But I want you to see that what we're reading here in Daniel chapter 12 concerns very much the people of Israel, and it concerns God dealing with Israel again. Uh, and Michael is standing up, standing up for the nation of Israel standing up to protect them. You see the intervention in the verse number 1. Then you see the tribulation in verse number 1. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And here again, we're at the same time. During this time, there's going to be a time of trouble, and according to Daniel 12, verse 1, there has never been a time like it. What Hitler did to the Jews during World War II was awful, probably unsurpassed in horror and hatred and evil and, and, and known history. But the Word of God says it's going to get worse, and it's going to get worse for Israel. This has all taken place during the tribulation period. Jeremiah 30, verse 7 said this, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. Speaking of the same period, it is even the time of Jacob's trouble. And again, Jacob's trouble, it's, it's Israel's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Joel 2, verse 2, A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath never been the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. What's going to happen in the tribulation period has been unsurpassed in terms of evil, in terms of the disaster that's going to befall planet earth. Jesus Christ said this in Matthew 24, verse 22, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. And according to Matthew 24, it's still future, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And then it goes on to talk about the Son of Man coming in His glory. As far as Christ was concerned, this tribulation period was still future. And it's still future tonight. But there's going to be a time of tribulation. That uh, details of the tribulation are outlined from uh, Revelation chapter 6 through to Revelation chapter 19. Uh, and it will be a time when, when Israel will be purified. It's a time, indeed, there'll be much suffering throughout the world. Israel already ha has suffered from the Babylonians. We mentioned it last night. They've suffered from the Medo-Persians. They've suffered from the Greeks, suffered from the Romans. They've suffered from the Crusaders. They've suffered in modern Europe. They've suffered from the Herods. They've suffered from the Hitlers. They have suffered and suffered. But let me say, the worst is yet to come. Deuteronomy 4, verse 30, When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if they turn to the Lord thy God, and shall be obedient unto his voice. I wouldn't have time tonight to go into the tribulation period. But we know it'll be a time of war. It'll be a time of famine. 25% of the world will be wiped out. There's going to be a collapse of heavenly bodies. One-third of the earth will be destroyed. One-third of the sea destroyed and the creatures in it and any ships that are upon it. One-third of fresh water and many multitudes of people who drink it will die. One-third of the skylights and the stars will be removed. Uh, in Daniel chapter 9, uh, we read about the, the demons uh, being let loose upon the earth, and it's going to really be hell upon earth. It's interesting if you read Revelation 9 verse 21, it talks about murders. It'll be a time when life is cheap. 
It talks about sorceries. And the word sorcery is the Greek word pharmakia, where pharmacy comes from. It'll be a time not only of murders, it'll be a time of, of drugs being rampantly used. It'll be a time of fornication, Revelation 9.21 says. It'll be a sex-mad society. It'll be a time of theft. It'll be a time when, as we say in Northern Ireland, someone would steal the eye out of your head. You see, if you see these things, if you see a society where life is cheap, and let me tell you, life is cheap, Upwards of 200,000 babies are aborted every year in the United Kingdom. 200,000? You try and work that out every week. Life's cheap. Do we live in a drug-crazed society? Yes, we do. Do we live in a sex-mad society? Can you really go down through the street and not see the adverts? Can you watch your television and not blush? You see, I believe there's demonic involvement today. And as we see these things rising and rising, I believe we're approaching the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's just a little taste of the tribulation period. Zechariah 13, verse 8, tells us this. It shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die. Two-thirds of the Jewish nation will be wiped out. It's estimated tonight there are 15 million Jews in the world. If it were to happen tonight, 10 million Jews would perish. That's what the tribulation period is going to like. Have you some in your family tonight that are not saved? I'll tell you, you need to be on your knees for them. There could be some people living in Kilkeel tonight will have to live through the tribulation period and probably perish in it and go to a lost sinner's hell. The same man who penned John 3 and 16, inspired by the Spirit of God, has written the book of Revelation. You can't take one without the other. And if you believe John 3 and 16, you better believe the book of Revelation. There's a time of trouble and tribulation coming upon this world, and the world has never seen the like of it. After that tribulation, according to Revelation 19, uh, John says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. The Lord Jesus Christ is then coming back. Israel is going to know intervention. Michael will stand up for them. Israel will know tribulation, but you know Israel will know salvation. Look again at verse number 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Thy people shall be delivered. There will be those of Israel who will be saved. One third will survive the tribulation period. Paul says in Romans 11, verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved, that is it written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away on godliness from Jacob. There is a future for Israel tonight. And they will come back to the Lord. And they will accept the Messiah. And they will look upon him whom they have pierced. And they will embrace Christ. And Jesus will establish his kingdom and will rule and reign for that 1,000 years we mentioned on a previous night. Israel will know intervention. Israel will know tribulation. Israel will know salvation. They're going to know resurrection. Look at Daniel 12, verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame. You see, death is not the end. Uh, and there's going to be a resurrection. I believe uh, this is speaking of the resurrection of uh, tribulation saints, but I don't want to go into the nuts and bolts of it this evening. I want to get to verse number four especially, but there's going to be resurrection following the tribulation. Tribulation saints will, will rise from the dead. You read about it in Revelation chapter 20 that those who hadn't the mark and those who were martyred, it says they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. There's going to be resurrection. And then there's reflection. Look at verse number 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever 
and ever. And here uh, we get a glimpse again of something that's happening during the tribulation period. There are going to be those who will turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. There are those who will be wise. There'll be those who'll understand what is happening, and they, they will warn men and women to repent, and there will be those who'll be saved during the tribulation period. Here they're described as those that are wise. Here they are described as those that turn many to righteousness. Proverbs 11, verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. During the tribulation period, there are going to be two witnesses. There's going to be 144,000 Jewish evangelists, uh, and there's going to be a, a lot of people who are going to be saved during the tribulation period. But let me say this, if you're in the meeting tonight and you're not saved, it's not going to be you. It's not going to be you. I'll tell you why it's not going to be you. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11, this is what we read. Let me read verse number 9 to you. Uh, and just so that you can see we're in the same period. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. It's speaking of the same time when Antichrist is ruling and reigning. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. He's speaking of those who rejected the truth who could have been saved. I believe those who have heard the gospel and rejected the gospel will have no further opportunity when Jesus Christ returns. This is what Paul goes on to say. And for this cause, remember, they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. God sent this Son that you might be saved. But God's going to send strong delusion at that time. Why is God going to send strong delusion that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Could I say to you tonight, if you're not saved, now is your time. I believe if Jesus Christ comes back, those who've had the privilege to hear the gospel, to understand the gospel, who've rejected the gospel, I believe for you there's no further hope. And if Jesus comes back tonight, you're going to be lost and lost for all eternity. As I thought about those who will win souls during the tribulation period, I asked myself the question, am I wise tonight? Am I seeking to turn many to righteousness in verse number 3? Have I a desire to see souls saved? Have I a desire to reach the lost with the, the gospel this evening? Have I a desire to see my family saved? God forbid that any of them would ever go through this awful tribulation period. Paul says in Philippians 2, verse 15, he says, That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And then he goes on to say, holding forth the word of life. Is that what we're doing tonight? Is that what you're doing in your life? Are you holding forth the word of life? The idea was used of someone in a restaurant holding out food to people? Are we holding out the gospel to those who are perishing tonight? When you come to prophecy, it always challenges us, doesn't it? You see, Israel will know intervention. Michael will stand up for them. Israel will know tribulation. There's going to be a, an awful time upon this world. Israel will know salvation. Uh, there will be those from uh, Jewish background who will accept the Messiah. Israel will know resurrection and the tribulation saints, and I believe the Old Testament saints as well. Then there's the reflection. Uh, there are those who will be wise. There will be those who will turn many uh, to righteousness. And then we come to an instruction in verse number four. And this is really what I want to get to this evening. That's not bad for an introduction. Sure, it's not. Look at verse number four. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Daniel is told that this book has a special application to the time of the end. Let me say, Daniel was writing things here that he didn't understand. Inspired by the Spirit of God, he's, he's writing things that are going to happen centuries, indeed millennia later. And you and I tonight, with the benefit of hindsight, with the benefit of what things have happened in the world, and we've touched on some of them over the past few nights, have a greater understanding of what Daniel has written than Daniel had himself. 
And Daniel's in writing inspired by the God, inspired by the Lord, inspired by the Spirit of God. And look what the Lord says in verse 4, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. And God is saying this book will not be fully understood until the time of the end. When we come to Revelation 22, verse 10, and John is writing the last book of the Bible again, inspired by the Spirit of God. This is what John is told. And he said unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. John's told, don't be sealing the book. The book's open. Now's the time. And now's the time tonight for us to look into these prophecies and to try and understand what is happening, try and understand what's going on in the world. And so you see the instruction given to Daniel here to seal the book. And then you see uh, the remainder of verse number four. What does this mean? And many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. You see, I believe, uh, and I believe this is primarily what it's teaching. It's talking about those during the tribulation period, particularly the Israels, the Jews, and they're going to see what's happening. And they're going to be asking questions. Why this Holocaust again? Why all this tribulation? Why all this torment? Why all these things happening in the world? Revelation 16 talks about men being smitten with cancerous sores and the sun beating so hot and the water has been turned bitter and they can't drink the water and it's torture and it's torment and there'll be those who'll be running about asking why, 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 why is this happening? And that's the idea of running to and fro. It's used in Jeremiah 5, verse 1. Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and see now and know. It's a, it's a quest for knowledge, trying to understand what's happening, what's going on. It's used in Zechariah 4, verse 10. Uh, for who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. For they are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. It's the idea of a, of a quest to, to understand, to try and find out what's happening. And I believe there'll be a rush and there'll be a desire to try and understand what's going on in the world. Why is this happening? And they'll come to the book of Daniel. And they'll open up the book of Daniel. And they'll discover from the book of Daniel why these things are coming to pass. And they'll have an understanding that they wouldn't have had in the days of Daniel. And they'll come to understand what's happening in the Word of God. Leon Wood and his commentary says this, Many shall run to and fro in their desire for the knowledge of the last things, and finding it in Daniel's book, because it will have been preserved to the end, their knowledge shall be increase. Now, that's the interpretation, but listen, there's an implication to that. John MacArthur said he's not talking primarily about the increase of scientific knowledge primarily, although there may be an illusion or an implication that could be drawn because of this. You see, the idea that they need to move about quicker, the idea they need to try and get their hands in knowledge, I believe it's teaching. And Henry Morris, that great Bible expositor, he just takes it literally, and he says, listen, travel will increase and knowledge will increase. I believe it's implied as they desire knowledge, as there's a quest for knowledge, they'll go to the furthest ends of the world to try and discover what's going on and what's happening. And I believe, uh, as we see an increase in travel and an increase in knowledge, I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is using this tonight to say to you and to say to me that He's coming, and He's coming soon. The Lord Jesus said this in Matthew 16, verses 1 to 3, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting desired Him that He would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but ye cannot discern the signs of the time. And the Lord said to them, Listen, you know by the color of the sky what the weather's going to be like, and you can work out by these signs what's going to happen in the weather, and yet you don't even understand who I am. 
If they had have opened their Old Testament Scriptures, they would have known from Zechariah that, uh, that he was the Messiah. They'd have known he would ride into Jerusalem in the fall of Anas. They'd have known from Daniel chapter 9 uh, that he was going to come, he was going to be the Messiah. They'd have known from what family he would become. They'd be known where he was going to be born. And if they had to search the Old <coughs> Testament Scriptures, they would have understood who Christ was. And the Lord says, you're hypocrites. You can tell the weather by looking at the signs, but you can't look into the Scriptures and know that I am here. The same thing could be said of His second coming. There are many signs in the world. There are political signs. There are economical signs, social signs, natural signs, national signs, moral signs, religious signs, and there are many things. And I believe what we have in Daniel chapter 12 is another one of those signs. I believe increased travel is an indication again that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming and is coming soon. Some of you here and your grandparents probably never traveled out of Northern Ireland. Used to be an old man visited in, in our home when we were children, and he'd never been outside County Tyrone. His brother had gone to France in 1916 for the Battle of the Somme, but he never returned. One of the many he lost his life, but he'd never been outside County Tyrone in his life. My mother has been to the Isle of Man. She's been to Scotland. She's been to England, but that's it. When her and my dad were married, they spent their honeymoon in Garva. What a romantic location, Garva. How times have changed. How times have changed. Used to be if you wanted to travel, you had to walk, ride, or sail. In December the 17th, 1903, Orville Wright piloted the first powered airplane. It went 20 feet up into the air. The flight lasted for 20 seconds, and it covered 120 feet. And how we've advanced from then. We have now cars and planes and jets and spacecraft. Sir Isaac Newton, I mentioned this last night, who lived between 16 and 42 and 1727, described by Wikipedia as the greatest scientist the world has ever known, says his knowledge to science has been unsurpassed. Of course, these things are arguable, but he read Daniel chapter 12. He read these verses. And he said, what I see in the future is that somehow man will be able to travel at a speed of 50 miles an hour. Now remember, he died in 1727. There were no motor vehicles. There was nothing. And yet he could see from Scripture that this was going to happen. Voltaire, the atheist, he laughed at him. He, he lived during the same period from 1694 to 1778. I didn't write down the full quote. He says, now look at the mighty mind of Newton. When he has become old, he's got into dotage. In other words, he's beginning to dote, and he's starting to study the Bible. But when you look back tonight, you can see which one was doting and which one was sensible. Newton knew from reading this prophecy that uh, indeed the uh, uh, travel would increase. You know, there's a, a jet being prepared at the moment uh, that will fly from London to Sydney in three and a half hours. It'll go twice as fast as Concord. It'll travel at 2,664 miles per hour. It'll travel at 62,000 feet. You'll be able to see the curvature of the earth if you happen to be in this plane. The hypermatch chief executive, Richard Lugg, wants the plane to be in the skies within 10 years. He has already secured funding from the British government. These things are happening. At any time, there are 5,000 flights in the sky with over a quarter of a million people in the sky. Through cars, we travel combined something like 500 billion kilometers per year. Space uh, can tr spacecraft can travel at 20,000 miles an hour. And this has all happened in our lifetime. That's what Daniel said, many shall travel to and fro. And then he went on to say knowledge shall increase. Do we live in an age of increased knowledge? Doctors have learned more in the last 50 years than they'd learned in the previous 2,000 years. During recent history, the telephone has been invented, the radio has been invented, the computer has been invented, and the television. Now you have all of these gadgets in your mobile phone, every one of them. Technology is moving faster. 
Buckminster Fuller created what's known as the knowledge doubling curve. He noticed that up until 1900, human knowledge doubled approximately every century. After the end of World War II, he said knowledge was doubling every 25 years. When they look at knowledge today, they look at nanotechnology. Apparently, it's doubling every two years. Clinical knowledge is doubling every 12 months. If you take an average, knowledge is now doubling, doubling every 13 months. Used to be every century. Now it's every 13 months. According to uh, IBM, they said when they build out of the, what they call the Internet of Things, knowledge will double every 12 hours. Every 12 hours. Knowledge is moving so fast that the top 10 in-demand jobs didn't exist six years ago. One lecturer said this, we're having to prepare students for jobs that don't exist, to cope with technology not invented, to handle problems that no one has yet encountered. There's no longer the old job for life. The average young person will have 10 to 14 jobs by the time they reach the age of 38. 30 years ago, perhaps even going a little bit further back, husbands and wives usually met in church socials. Perhaps some of them met in the, the dance halls and the orange halls, wherever it happened to be. Uh, now, one in eight people uh, never actually meet because they meet online. One in eight who get married meet online. Things are changing. Used to send messages by pigeon, by Pony Express, uh, by the postman. And now, of course, we've got, uh, we had telegrams, we have telephone messages, we had uh, fax machines. In 1992, 157 tax messages were, were sent in that whole year. 157. In the last 24 hours, more tax messages have been sent than there are people on the planet. Knowledge is moving, and it's moving fast. If business wanted to reach 50 million people in the age of television, it took 13 years. The internet reduced that to four years. With the introduction of MP3s and iPods, it was reduced to three years. Facebook say they can reach 50 million people now in two years. If you bought a newspaper today, one of the national newspapers, you have more information in a newspaper today, one newspaper, than someone living in the 17th century had for their whole lifetime. That's how knowledge has increased. Professors are saying that an IT degree student will discover that by year three, year one, is out of date. James says, be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. You see the intervention tonight. You see tribulation tonight. You see salvation tonight and resurrection and reflection and instruction. And then you see the implication. Travel will become easier and travel will increase and knowledge is going to increase. There'll be a knowledge explosion. This is what old Daniel had revealed to him. Written in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, thousands of years ago. You and I are living in a, in a very privileged age. And we're seeing these things come to pass. It tells me tonight that Jesus Christ is coming. And I believe he's coming. And he's coming very soon. Some of you will have heard of the doomsday clock. It's a clock that's hanging in Chicago. Uh, and when there was the nuclear problems going back into the 40s, they, they brought this clock out to suggest when perhaps the world could end through a, a, a man-made catastrophe. Uh, the last time the clock was set, they now have brought not only nuclear warfare, but they've brought uh, all different things into it, including climate change. It was last set on January 22nd, 2015, and they reckon it's three minutes to midnight, three minutes on this doomsday clock, three minutes to doomsday. I don't know, and I'm sure they don't know. But I do know that Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon. I know if you're not saved tonight, it's a doomsday scenario for you. And you don't have to listen to me tonight. Listen to the words of the Lord Jesus. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. He's coming. He's coming soon. And the Lord himself says, you be ready. Let's bow in a moment's prayer.